Good, some of you go, who's the tan guy on stage? So today I'm gonna preach in Spanish. For all of you that wanna know that, some of you go, is he kidding? No, I'm really not, yeah, whatever. And I'm so glad to be back with you guys. Listen, it's been a long time, I missed you guys. Some of you said, wow, like we thought you like left the country, like you fled in the witness protection program or something like that. But let me tell you where we've been. Last couple of weeks, Tracy and I have been away. We celebrated our 25th wedding anniversary. Yeah, come on. It's awesome. We made our plans for the next 25 years, which we're very, very excited about. Our goal is to top the, the first 25 years with the next 25 years. And so we got big goals for our life and for our marriage. And so we went away, we actually went out to California for a little while and just spent some time just kind of reacquainting ourselves. Like, hey, after 25 years, I'm still madly in love with you. Like, this is awesome. And, uh, and then we came back and had a little time off. I took a study trip to get ready for next year's sermon series, which I'm very, very excited about. And then I ended my time away at beach camp with about 450 radically crazed teenagers. I mean, radical. Like, if you've never been in a room with 450 teenagers screaming their lungs out to Jesus, like you have missed it in your life. And so what a capstone to our time away to get to be with our students and with our leaders. And let me say this too, man, we don't ever need to take for granted what God's doing in the lives of our students, okay? They're not the next generation, they are the now generation. And so I want us to celebrate as a church, LaGrange and Noonan, all that God did in the lives of our students and the lives of our leaders. And so I'm so thankful you're here today. I'm glad that you're here on the first week of our Broverb series. So some of you are confused by the name. You're like, Broverbs? Like, I've heard of Proverbs, right? Like you go there and you find wisdom, but what is Broverbs all about? Well, let me say this, man. We need the men of God, the men of the church, the men who claim to follow Jesus, to be wise and to stand up and take our country back and lead our country and lead our churches. Can I get an amen? Right? And we live in this culture where sometimes men are just kind of tamped down. They're kind of like put their thumb, like, like sometimes our culture just kind of says, hey man, you're here to make money. You're here to fill a 401k account. You know, you're here to fix your kid's bicycle. But guys, I just want to tell you, man, God's got more for you than that. I was praying right before I got up here and the Lord told me, said, Sean, don't ever forget when you stand on the stage, you're looking in the eyes of the destiny of South Atlanta. So I'm looking around and I see all these men and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is the destiny of this culture, of this generation. LaGrange, those of you at LaGrange today, we are literally looking at the destiny of the town of LaGrange and of Noonan and Peachtree City and this whole area. Because here's what I believe. I believe if you can touch and change the heart of a man, you can change a nation. And some of you say, well, wow, this is a great series. I wish you would do it like as a weekend retreat. Well, here's why. Because when you have a weekend retreat, only the men who are really going after it for God show up. And so I wanna do it on Sunday morning. In fact, I just wanna tell you for the next two or three weeks here on Sunday morning, we're gonna have kind of like a men's retreat here on Sunday morning. It's going to be awesome. And some of you go, hey, uh, pastor, uh, you don't understand. There's women in the room. Listen, women, you need to hear what I'm going to talk about. Every mom, every grandma, every sister, every wife needs to hear what we speak into the lives of men. Because as women, you can come alongside and help every man in this room step in to his God-given destiny for his life. And so moms come to me all the time, sisters come to me all the time and say, listen, I wish you would talk to my husband. I wish you'd talk to my brother. I wish you'd talk to my son. I hear moms cry for their sons. In fact, I wanna tell you, do you realize in America, the most unchurched person in America is a male between the ages of 24 and 30 years of age? They're just not there. So do we need a series called Proverbs? Yeah, we need a series called Proverbs. And I wanna tell you how awesome it's gonna be because over the next couple of weeks, I'm gonna explain something to you I call the bro code. The bro code. Some of you go, what in the world is the bro code? Okay, we've been kind of teasing about it on video a little bit, but here's the thing. Every guy knows there's a bro code. Every single guy in this room knows that there's a bro code. There's things that guys do and things that guys don't do, right? Come on guys, are we with it? You know what I'm talking about. So the other day I was driving down the street this, this is one of those bro code moments for me. I'm driving down the street 
and there's a pink Escalade with a Mary Kay sticker on the back. And driving down the street, and I look at Tracy, and I said, I think that person's going to cut me off. And uh, they kind of bumped in front of me, and I thought, that, that she cut me off. And I went to pass the pink Escalade, and there's a guy driving the pink Mary Kay Escalade. Bro code number 77. Unless someone is dying and bleeding out, men, don't ever drive the Mary Kay car. <clears throat> Guys just know it, right? And some of you go, oh, I'm offended. I, I, I sell Mary Kay. Listen, I'm not talking about Mary Kay today. I'm talking about Jesus today. Okay, but I just wanna tell you, guys, no, we have a bro code. There are things that we do and things that we say and things that we don't say as men. Like for instance, you will never hear a guy say on Friday at 6 p.m. these four words, let's go to Walmart. <laughs> right, can I get an amen? <laughs> if you do, he's been smoking weed and he's hungry or something, I don't know. But, but I just wanna say, you're not gonna hear that from the mouth of a guy, okay? Like if you walk in on a guy and the channel gets stuck on the Bravo network, he's gonna unplug the television. He ain't gonna stay there, okay? There's just things, and, and here's what I wanna say. There's wisdom that we need as men because our culture doesn't give us a lot of guy wisdom. In fact, a lot of times they look at us guys like we're stupid. And the truth is we're not. God wants us to step into his destiny for our lives. So I wanna begin with just the guys in the room today. Men, are you here today? Yeah. LaGrange, Noonan, are you here? Okay, so how many of y'all have ever played this on a trip, called this, this little game called Would You Rather? Y'all ever played that? This is great to play, by the way, on a, on a trip. I love playing it with young kids because they come up with questions I've never thought about. Okay, so for guys, okay, so I want you to call it out. You just call out whatever your answer is. Would you rather play one-on-one -on -one with Michael Jordan for five minutes or would you rather dunk on LeBron James? Go. That's what I thought, okay. <laughs> would you rather be lost at sea or lost in space? See, you guys have a bro code, man. You guys know this stuff. Guys love space. We love fire and space. Space and fire. When you can put fire in space, every guy is happy, okay? Can I get an amen, all right? Would you, would you rather always have bad hair or always have bad teeth? That's right, guys are like, I don't need hair anyway, it's gonna fall out. And it's gonna grow in places I don't want it to grow, okay, out my nose. So the other thing, would you rather freeze to death in the Arctic or would you rather burn to death in the desert? Oh, this is great, some of you are perplexed. Would you rather rock a, walk across a mile of hot burning coals or walk across a mile of Legos? Oh, I heard coals. Like, give me the hot coals. But if I walk across Legos, like, that's it, okay. Uh, would you rather listen to the same Justin Bieber song for 24 straight hours or run 10 miles? Some of you said 20 miles. But fathers, you that have teenage girls, you're about to go on vacation, and I warn you, 24 hours of Bebo will warp your mind. Okay, get a hold of yourself. <laughs> Would you rather fight a shark or fight a bear? Yeah, because you go, I'm faster than the bear. Yeah, but he's got big old paws. He's gonna kill you, okay? Would you rather meet Jason Bourne or James Bond? Oh, born any day, come on. That dude could, yeah, he'll kill you with his right pinky, all right? So here's the biggest one, you ready? Would you rather be successful at everything you do in life or have significance in what matters most? <laughs> it's a big question, isn't it? See, when it comes to success, that's what we're gonna talk about today, how men and how we deal with success, because here's what I know, every man in this room wants two things. Every man in this room really wants two things. When you boil it down, they wanna be respected and they wanna be successful. If a man knows that he has other people's respect, especially those he loves the most, and if a man knows, man, my life is counting for something, I am successful, he is happy. Now it's funny when I say that because some of you think the two things man wants is ESPN and hot wings. 
But I believe every man wants to be respected and every man wants to be successful. And how we define success determines what we seek after in life. So men, we gotta understand, is it about money? Is it about power? Is it about position? Is it about all these things? And, and the truth is it's not. But it's crazy because our culture defines success for men in some very weird ways. Now, here's what I mean when I say that. I have never been to a business or a leadership conference where the guy got on stage and said, today I am talking to you because I have failed at my business. <laughs> today I'm talking to you because I failed at my family. You don't go to conferences on leadership to talk to people who have failed. But yet all of us have failed in life. So there's this kind of elusive thing about success that somehow the person that can stand on a stage can talk about it because somehow they've done something better or more achievable than something else. And, and that's just not the truth. That's not true at all. If you have your Bible, I want you to turn to the book of 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles, I say, oh yeah, he's going OT this morning. I am totally going OT. Chronicles is the story of many of the kings of Israel. And when you go to 1 Chronicles, you read a lot of different things and you get into 2 Chronicles and it gets very interesting because we see a snapshot of some people's lives. Now today I wanna to talk to you about a guy, his name is Uzziah. Everybody say Uzziah. Everyone say Uz. Okay, none of you named your children Uz, okay? But Uzziah, uh, most of the time in the Bible, people don't even know his story because the only thing we know about him is from Isaiah 6, where the Bible says, in the year that King Uzziah died, the Bible says of Isaiah, I saw the Lord. Like Isaiah had this incredible encounter with God and it forever changed the direction of his life. So who is this guy that Isaiah talked about and why is he so important to us in the Bible? And how does it fit into the bro code that God wants us to have for our life. Well, I wanna show you a picture of a guy. Now, let me tell you the story. King Uzziah became king at 16 years of age. How many of you are 16? Raise your hand, all right? How many of you would love to be king? Like president of the United States today. How many of you would love to have a president who's 16 years old? Some of you go, well, that's a good choice <laughs> this year. But let me say this, man, God can use a 16-year-old like he can use a 60-year-old. The Bible says of King Uzziah, he became king at the age of 16 and he followed his father's footsteps, who was the king, and he was king for 52 years. He was the second longest reigning king in the history of Judah. But look what the Bible says about his life, starting with verse one, 2 Chronicles 26. It says, then all the people of Judah took Uzziah, who was 16 years old, and made him king in place of his father, Amaziah. He was the one who rebuilt Elath and restored it to Judah after Amaziah rested with his ancestors. So in other words, he, he started his career as king by rebuilding some ancient places. Look at verse three. Uzziah was 16 years old when he became king and he reigned in Jerusalem 52 years. His mother's name was Jechaliah. She was from Jerusalem. Now, why did the scripture point that out to us? Because he wanted us to understand that he was being raised by a single mom. And so I wanna say something to all the single moms in the room today. If you're raising a boy and you feel like, OMG, like I have no idea how to do this, I wanna tell you God uses godly stepmoms and grandmas as much as he uses a man in a child's life. And I wanna bless you today. I wanna bless you today for being the spiritual influence just like Jechaliah was in Uzziah's life. Because when his father died and at 16 and he became king, all he had was a godly mom, and it says that she was from Jerusalem, or she went to Jerusalem because she was a God-fearing woman. Let me tell you what'll help change the men of our culture. We need more God-fearing women, and we need more God-fearing men, and we're gonna talk about how we can do that today. So I just wanted to point that out. Number four, he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father Amaziah had done. Look at verse five. He sought God during the days of Zechariah. That was one of the prophets, one of the leaders, religious leaders maybe a priest at the time. It wasn't the guy who wrote the book of Zechariah, but it was a guy who had a spiritual influence on his life. He sought God during the days of Zechariah, who instructed him in the fear of God. And look what it says. As long as he sought the Lord, God gave him success. Look what it says, verse six. He went to war against the Philistines, and he broke down the walls of Gath, Jabneth, and Ashdod. 
which were big strongholds for the Philistines, by the way. He then rebuilt towns near Ashdod and elsewhere among the Philistines. And God helped him against the Philistines and against the Arabs who lived in Gerbel and against the Munites. Now listen, here's why that's big. He was a warrior. He was a battlefield commander. His bro code was, if somebody is against the army of God, we're gonna go take them out. And he took strongholds away from the enemy. Look at verse eight, the Ammonites brought tribute to Uzziah and his fame spread as far as the border of Egypt because he had become very powerful. Listen, as God began to use him, as he sought the Lord and God was giving him success, people knew his name. They were talking about him. They were putting him on the A-list. And they would even come and they would bring tribute to him, which back in those days was a sign that you were powerful. But look at verse nine. Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem at the corner gate, at the valley gate and at the angle of the wall. And he fortified them. He also built towers in the wilderness and dug many cisterns, which digging wells back then was a huge, huge thing. When you dug a well, it meant other people lived. Because he had much livestock in the foothills and in the plain, he had people working his fields and vineyards in the hills and in the fertile lands, for he loved the soil. That means he wasn't some king who sat in a palace. He was out there with the people and he was saying, let's plant crops here so that more people can live when the famine comes. What a powerful man. Look at verse 11. Uzziah had a well-trained army. He was ready to go out by divisions according to their numbers as mustered by Jael and the secretary and Manasseh and, and the, uh, the officer under the direction of Hananiah, one of the royal officials. Look at this. The total number of family leaders over the fighting men was 2,600. He had 2,600 leaders of leaders. Men, how would you like to finish your life and say you equipped and led 2,600 men who led thousands of others? Wouldn't that be significant? I'd call that success. And under their command was an army of 307, 500 men trained for war. A powerful force to support the king against his enemies. And Uzziah provided shields, spears, helmets, coats of armor, bows, and sling stones for the entire army. He innovated things. Look what it says. In Jerusalem, he made devices. Verse 15, invented for the use on the towers and on the corner defenses so that the soldiers could shoot arrows and hurl large stones from the walls. He may have invented the catapult, which forever changed modern war. But look what it says. His fame spread far and wide for he was greatly helped until he became powerful. Wow, what a guy. I'd say, I'd say he's a pretty good picture of success, right? Like you can look at him and say, man, look at his accolades. Like he wouldn't show up at the upward ceremony and get the participation trophy, right? Like he would probably, by the way, I just wanna say this. When I was playing baseball as a kid, I got a third place trophy and I'm more proud of it than any trophy I've ever got. Because I did more than participate, I competed. And I just wanna say that for the fathers. Fathers, we need to help our kids understand what it means to win and lose in life because that's reality. That's just reality. That's a bro code right there, bro. You can tap that on your shoulder, but your friends will think you're weird, okay? He was fame was spread far and wide and he was greatly helped until he became powerful. What is it about Uzziah's life that we need to look at? What is the bro code? that we need to understand about him so that men, sons, husbands, we can keep ourselves from not being like Uzziah but bypassing his legacy. I wanna say you three things today. If you have a pen, I want you to write these down. If we're gonna know the bro code to be successful, first of all, we can understand, recognize the true source of all success. We need to recognize the true source of all success. The Bible says in 2 Chronicles 26, 5, look what it says. It says, as long as he sought the Lord, God gave him success. And you know, sometimes you read those stories in the Old Testament, you go, okay, as long as he sought the Lord. But then you go back and you start studying those words. That word sought is the same word for seek. And the word there in the Hebrew is darash. And it means that he sought after, and it basically means this. He beat a path between his life and God's. 
And we don't understand that term because we're not an agrarian society anymore, but back in those days, you would have mountainous regions and you would have hills, and the only way that roads were ever formed was when someone left the current path and walked through the brush or walked through the grass and they began to beat a new path. Here's what God was saying. And the Hebrews and the Jewish people of the day understood this word very well. It's how they created roads. And here's what God said of Uzziah's life. He knew the source of all success because the Bible says he beat a path between him and God. He walked after God in such a way that it cleared the ground. Like, can you imagine, like, it's, it even says here, he, he basically, when, when the prophet or the priest, Zechariah, would come around, he would sit under his teachings because he wanted to seek the Lord. Like, everything he did, he realized his dependency on God. Now, that's difficult for a guy because in our culture, we don't always get that. I wanna make a really awesome statement to you today. Success in life for you is found in seeking God, not in selling yourself. It's in seeking God. The Bible says he wore out a path between him and God. You know the great thing about that? I'm sure after his death, other people looked and said, I wanna be a king like Uzziah who sought the Lord. Because success comes from not from selling yourself, it comes from seeking God. In fact, I wrote this down this week, we become successful in life when we have the right posture before God, not the right position before man. Because the world looks at us and they rank us by our position, and God doesn't do that. So we gotta understand what is the source of all our success. Let me tell you the second thing about King Uzziah's life I find just amazing. We need to learn to measure our lives according to God's plan, not man's plan. We need to learn to measure our lives as men according to God's plan, not man's plan. What does the Bible say about man's plan? Look at what it says in Proverbs 16, 9. It says, the heart of a man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. Now, what's crazy about that is men, we want to plan everything. Now, we would never tell our wife because we don't want her to know what we're thinking about all the time, right? Like, you wanna take me on a pick, you know? None of that stuff. But the idea is that, man, we are planning our success all the time. Where do I wanna be when I'm 60? What do I wanna do when I'm 45? What do I want, you know? And the truth is this, if we're not careful in our life, we will settle for man plans. But the Bible says, man, the heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. You can plan, but at some point you gotta decide to measure your life according to God's plan and not man's plan. You ever thought about this? God measures differently than man. Think about all the way that man measures, all right? We have anyone here who lift weights? Anybody lift weights here? All right. All right, come right up here, would you? Oh, you got a cast on. Hey, dude, that's cool. These girls are gonna wanna date you when that's over, okay? You'll have some girls signing your cast. You can't come forward? Okay. Oh, hey, y'all give him a hand, man. All right, hold up your bicep. Dude, you need to get in the gym. Yes, I haven't lifted in like two months, so. You haven't lifted too much? Okay, but that's a sad story for the girls, so you can play that up, like I've been my legs, I'm just teasing you. Anyway, that's how we measure. Hey, anyone got a wallet? Somebody throw me your wallet. Hey, throw me your wallet. Come on, Nate, throw me your wallet. All right, let, let me measure your wallet here. That's not big. It's not big. Three. You got any credit cards in here? No. Yeah, I'm gonna, what's your credit score? I wanna measure that. Yeah, credit card. How, what's the limit on this one? Yeah, see, that's how we measure. Right? Come on, let's be honest. I've walked into a car place before and they say, if you got this score, we'll sell you anything. I mean, you can have three of the guys working in the back if your credit score is good. We measure so differently. God doesn't measure that way. 
God doesn't measure the same way that man measures. And that's our problem as men sometimes. I want you to hear this, write this down. Man measures the hustle, God measures the heart. Because here's the struggle in being a guy. I have sometimes come to the Lord and said, God, I want you to do things my way and I want you to do it in my time and I want you to do it here and now. And in a sense, I am in a sense trying to hustle God. But in this world, here's what the world tells you. Hey man, if you're gonna be successful, you gotta hustle. You gotta make it happen. You gotta make it happen for yourself. I love it when these guys get on these award shows and, and they say, I did it myself. And the record producers over there going, bro, <laughs> we paid you a lot of money to do it yourself. Guys, listen, man measures the hustle, God measures the heart. You can't hustle God. And I wanna tell you as men, you'd be much happy in your life if you quit trying to hustle God and you'd let him shape your heart. You remember the story of Saul and David? You know why the people wanted Saul? Because he was tall. Hey, we, we need a king. So they went, they looked out and they found like Saul and he was tall and everyone else was probably shorter and said, six foot two, he's it, right there. Right, they measured Saul. They looked at him and said, oh yeah, man, you are a good speaker. Uh, man, you could probably make some arrows. Like we're gonna measure, how, how, how big's your leg, Saul? Do you remember what Saul did? He totally presumed on the things of God and wrecked his leadership. And the Bible says that God left Saul and he went and found a small guy out in the field. His name was David. And he said, I can do more with what doesn't measure up in man that you can. You see, man measures the hustle, God measures the heart. You know what else I realized? Man measures strength, God measures surrender. <coughs> how strong, how tough can I be? Instead of, God, would you make me tender toward you? But men, we measure our strength. How strong am I? I'm not talking about weightlifting strong. I'm talking about what we think we can endure in our life. Here's the problem with some of our homes. We have men who are too strong to be tender. And you have daughters and sons and children who are waiting for a daddy and they've never seen you cry. They've never heard you call their name out before Jesus. Jesus, I pray for my son. Jesus, I pray for my daughter. You wanna change your home, men? Surrender your life to Jesus to the point that your children hear you calling their name out before God. Because man measures strength, God measures strength. You know what else, man measures position? God measures the person. He don't care what your position is. I mean, think of David, man, out there with all those sheep. That was a whole lot of poop. That was a whole lot. And the truth is, God saw him and said, that's a man after my own heart. Because the world measures the position, how high can I go? And God measures the person, who is he becoming? Who is he willing to become for my name and for my namesake? You know what else I've learned? Man measures your past story, God measures your future glory. Man always looks at you and says, oh yeah, you're the guy who divorced his wife. Oh yeah, you're the guy who had the moral failure. Oh yeah, you're the guy who cheated at his job and got fired. Oh, oh, you're the guy that looked at pornography for 20 years and nobody knew about it. That's how man measures. God says, I see you right where you are and I see what you can become. I see your future glory, not your past story. Listen, I don't talk a lot about my past. I've got some crazy, stupid things I did in my past, but listen, I'm more caught up in what I'm becoming than who I was. And some of us, let me tell you how we become God's man. When we quit depending so much on our past story. In fact, I wanna make a statement to you, it wasn't even in my notes. You know how you become God's man? You quit being someone else's boy. I got a lot of pastor friends I'm talking church world here, okay? So I'm just being real honest. Who won't associate with me anymore because of where I'm pastor at. You say, are you kidding me? 
No, I'm serious. They don't call anymore. They don't email. You know, email, you know why? Because I'm nobody's boy. I want to tell you, church, I want to be God's man. And I don't care if I stand on anyone else's stage. I don't care if anyone ever calls me. Listen, I've never sent my resume anywhere and I never will. God always knows how to get a hold of me. And if he ever wants to send me somewhere, he will. But God has me right where I am. And I want you to know something. The day you choose to quit being somebody's boy is the first step to becoming God's man. It's just true. But here's the third one. You need to be strong enough to become weak. You need to be strong enough to become weak. What happened in Uzziah's life? The Bible says he became strong. What went wrong? He became strong. Say it with me. What went wrong? He became strong. I'm a guy, I have to rhyme it, all right? You know, it's tricky to rock a rhyme, okay? I can't, I gotta be able to figure these things out because I'm a guy. What went wrong? Listen, here's what the Lord said. Sean, it'll always go wrong when you become too strong. The Bible says this in verse 15 of his life, his fame spread far and wide for he was greatly helped until he became powerful. I love what it says in the King James Version. It says, for he was marvelously helped till he became strong. Have you ever been too strong? Of course you have, you've put Ikea furniture together. <laughs> Can I get an amen? You know what I'm talking about. They give you a little Allen wrench, guys, and they send you home and your wife says, can you have that done in 30 minutes? And you start putting that thing together and you rip every stinking bolt out of that fiber board. And you end up out back going, hey kids, campfire. <laughs> we get it, We're, we've been too strong. But, you know, we've all been too strong before. I want you to see this picture on the screen. Look at this picture real quick. Look at this first picture. Yeah, you know what that is? That's a hip. He said, that's very hip. No, that is very hip. You know whose hip that is? That's Bo Jackson's hip. You remember this play? Put up that picture if you would. Yeah, this play forever changed sports history. Some of you guys and some of you women are going, I don't understand, what, what is that? Okay, let me explain the play. Bo Jackson was one of the phenom athletes of all time. Back in the late 80s, I remember watching him play for the Kansas City Royals, hitting the ball out of the park, breaking like things over his knees. He didn't even have to go to the weight room. He was just a phenom. And he played college football and he did all these amazing things and he became a pro and he ended up with the Oakland Raiders. And on this very play that you see right here, something went wrong in Bo's life. You know what happened? He was too strong. If you hear him tell the story, he was running to the outside of the play to the right, and as he was sweeping around, he had an opportunity to give up the play and to go out of bounds, but because Bo knows and Bo was strong, he continued to run, and when the, go back to the picture, when the guy grabbed a hold of his leg, he was so strong, he ripped his own hip out of its own socket and severed the blood vessels and ended his career. Listen guys, success isn't wrong. Strong is wrong. God wants you to be successful. God wants you to not be too strong. You see, if you become successful at what you care most about in life, who you become is more important than being successful. Bo was too strong. If you did become successful, would you be too strong? Look what Paul says, because Paul talks about this. He's talking to the, the Corinthian church and he looks at them and says, hey guys, um, I am here and I'm talking to you and I've been writing these letters to you. And they've been, they, they were literally going to Paul saying, we don't know if you're really who you say you are. Like, we know you're writing all these letters to us because you're like the leader and help start these churches, but we just don't know. Look what Paul says about being strong and weak. Look what he says. But he said to me, he's talking about God. He talked about a thorn he had in his flesh. In fact, I was reading somewhere the other day, they believe the thorn could have been the church at Corinth. It wasn't maybe his wife that he was talking about or a, a physical affliction. He may have been talking about the church at Corinth. And he said, but he said to me, God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weakness so that Christ's power may rest on me. Men, are you strong enough to become weak? Are you just gonna stay 
too strong. What went wrong? Uzziah became too strong. His success changed him. You say, well, what happened? I'm just gonna tell you what happened and then we'll close. He went to the temple and he said, hey guys, I am so powerful that instead of the priest coming in to make sacrifices and burn incense, I'm gonna burn it because I'm Uzziah. And he walked in and he knew he wasn't supposed to do that. And he, he took 70 or 80 priests in with him, which could have cost them every one of their lives. And the Bible says he went in to burn incense and the Lord's anger saw his pride. And the Bible says in that moment that Uzziah was stricken with leprosy on his hand. What did the priests do? They looked at him and said, Uzziah, you can't do this, man. You're being too strong, like you're, you're, you're putting yourself ahead of God here, Uzziah. They tried to talk him out of it. Let me tell you if you know you're too strong as a man, how do you handle correction? You wanna know if you're too strong? How do you handle when someone corrects you? <laughs> I see a lot of men wincing. <laughs> I don't do so good sometimes. As a guy, I feel challenged when someone says you did that wrong. But the truth is, the way you know if you're too strong is how you handle correction. I got a story, I just can't share it, but it's hilarious, I'll share it some other time. He burned incense in the temple, he got corrected, and here's what happened. He went from God-reliance to self-reliance. Success can make you too strong to trust God. And he found this out. Listen to what Abraham Lincoln said. He said, nearly all men can stand adversity, but if you want to test a man's character, give him power. Nearly all men can stand adversity, but if you want to test a man's character, give him power. See, here's the good news today. If you're here at LaGrange, you're here at Noonan, there is some serious hope for every man who's in this room, okay? Here's why, you're still alive. And you can do something that can forever change a generation and forever rock a culture around you. Here's what I want you to consider doing. I want you to define the last line. You say, what do you mean? Well, look at, look at Uzziah, 2 Chronicles 26, 23. This is the last line of the story of Uzziah. This is what is said about him. Uzziah rested with his ancestors and was buried near them in a cemetery that belonged to the kings, for the people said he had leprosy. Now, you don't realize that because leprosy is not big in our culture, but basically, if you had leprosy, like they had your own town you had to go live in. No one touched you. No one got around you. But look what it says. Everything else he did in his life, all the armies, all the fortresses, all the swords, all the accomplishments, but the last line of his life was defined by these three or four words. He had leprosy. You see, the good news for us today is you're still alive. You can still define the last line. You know, as a pastor, I've written a lot of obituaries. I wrote my own parents' obituary, my mom and my dad, when they both died. And it's humbling when someone looks at you and said, would you write the obituary for this person? Because you try to find all the things that you know fit within the paper and everything else, but there's always that point in the obituary where it's just the same old obituary or there's one thing that stands out. And men, here's your step today, because we need a next step, right? We need to make it simple for men. Men, I wanna challenge you. Get out a piece of paper, open your Bible, and I want you to write and define the last words that you want to be spoken about your life. I thought a lot about this while I was preparing this. Lord, what do I want my last line to be? I would love for my last line to be, he followed Jesus and led thousands to follow him. Oh, that's much better than he had a lake house. That's much better than he had a Ferrari. He had a fat 401k. That's a whole lot better than he had a sweet cabin at Destin. Men. I beg you, define the last line and then go live for that. Because if you do, 
you will change your culture and you will change your generation.